Now turn to the fifth case on this morning's docket. That is case number 109886 in the matter of Daniel R. Beck, respondent. Counsel, may it please the court, Kate Baird appears on behalf of the Disciplinary Administrator's Office. Chief Justice Ness, may I reserve four minutes for rebuttal, please? Four minutes is granted. Thank you. Justices, this morning, and we are here still in the morning hour, uh, this morning you're not called to determine whether or not rules violations occurred in this case. Uh, the question before the court is whether and to what extent this respondent should be sanctioned for the misconduct in two disciplinary matters that were considered by a panel on April the 9th. It's the position of the disciplinary administrator's office that the conduct evidenced in these cases warrants at least discussion of disbarment and I'll be renewing my recommendation that I made at the panel that the panel consider recommending nothing less than indefinite suspension. The evidence presented and the evidence of the conduct in these two matters demonstrates a lack of regard by this respondent for the rules of the court, the order of an order of the court, and the obligation that this respondent had to conduct himself in a manner consistent with, our, with a professional obligation to act in a way that is honest, that is accurate, and that is authentic. In one matter, the respondent um, engaged in the unauthorized practice of law for more than three years, three years after having been ordered by this court to stop practicing. He maintained his estate planning practice in the Wichita area until he sought reinstatement from the court. That action, that conduct in and of itself is worthy of serious sanction. This case though uh, and the, the conduct really attention is drawn quite reasonably to actions that this respondent undertook on February 20th in the context of his responsibilities in an estate matter involving uh, Laura Hettenbach and his preparation, A, of estate planning documents on her behalf and then the dishonest and uh, I would say fraudulent um, authentication of these documents, uh, these estate planning documents. And although there's a tendency to look at those series of, of dishonest acts on the 20th, I will ask the court to look at this plan in a broader sense. Begin by asking, how can these documents be prepared without ever having spoken to Laura Hettenbach? The respondent's conduct strikes at the heart of probate. How can you draft end of life directives when you have not spoken to the person whose directives are being documented and recorded? The inquiry begins there. The respondent did not admit or stipulate that his conduct uh, involved a competence issue. The panel found that to be the case. The respondent never talked to Laura Hettenbach. We then get to the events of February 20th, which I would suggest to the court are inexcusable and inexplicable. 90-year-old Laura never woke up at the nursing home. The respondent directed his client 
Robert to sign her name to each of those documents. Seven, including a transfer of property from her to Robert, a will, a revised trust, health care directives. He directed Robert to sign her name to each of those documents. The respondent then with his wife attested not only to having seen Laura sign them, but to have attested to the fact that she had declared those instruments to be her intent. He falsely attested to, the, uh, to, to those representations having been made. Finally, he notarized the documents falsely assigning, uh, assigning his secretary's name. The panel concluded after hearing the evidence presented at the hearing that a two-year suspension was warranted. The uh, respondent suggests that that is an unduly harsh penalty that will cause the profession to, have to lose faith in the system. I would suggest to the court virtually the polar opposite, that if this conduct does not result in serious sanction, then we begin to question whether we self-govern. The action strikes at the heart of probate. Authentication is not superfluous. It is not unnecessary. It's fundamental. And he, the respondent uh, has an estate planning practice. These probate documents have to be the voice. We have to believe that they, uh, they are the voice of the person who can no longer speak for themselves. So to fabricate the authentication goes to the very heart of what he's called to do. The respondent suggests that the panel gave undue weight to ad uh, matters offered in mitigation and uh, insufficient, uh, I'm sorry, in aggravation and insufficient weight to matters offered in, uh, in mitigation. Uh, the panel pointed out in their report that they began by reviewing the standards of disbarment and they actually moved back from that. They noted that um, matters in mitigation were considered and they resulted in, in a recommendation of a two-year suspension. So the premise that somehow there was more weight given to matters offered in, um, in, in mitigation is inconsistent with what the report suggests. They began with disbarment. And, uh, and suspension and moved away from the disbarment to a two-year suspension. Uh, I would also point out that this was a panel that had been provided uh, a trial brief, which is a, an exceptional tool uh, in, in um, these proceedings, that the respondent had request opportunity to provide a, a present a trial brief. And so um, this matter actually had been set for hearing three times. Uh, the second time was continued due to inclement weather, uh, but a few weeks before that, the respondent was granted leave by the chair to, to present a trial brief. So the panel was well informed on the arguments and authorities that the respondent would be presenting to the panel as they considered the evidence. They had many of the arguments and authorities that the court has been presented. And I would suggest now uh, that to take the position that they were unduly prejudiced lacks support in the record and, and in fact. Um, I'll renew the um, recommendation that this court consider serious sanction and loss of license and consistently and follow your precedent um, suggesting that dishonest conduct cannot be remedied by probation um, and I can see the the harm to the clients I, I mean I'm, I'm I understand the fraudulent documents and, and it strikes to the heart of the of probate practice and all that should go into that I, I, I've got all that but just in terms of direct impact of this co misconduct and I'll grant you it's misconduct mm -hmm. the direct impact of this misconduct on the clients other than the $2,800 fee that was sort of what the panel hung their hats on, but I'm more interested in whether anything went to anybody that it, someone claimed later it wasn't supposed to go or that any of these documents did not 
uh, accurately reflect what the family would have intended anything like that well um, my, my first thought would be is uh, well there is po there is potential harm and the the uh, report concluded there was potential harm not actual harm to Laura Hedenbach potential harm and I would um, suggest that there is harm in proper in creating these documents when when we don't know that whether that's what she would have intended or would have wanted on the health care directive is there any evidence was, was there a health care directive before and this was just a new one there was a living will before uh, and I have no evidence and would pre present no evidence at the panel that there were instruments used that that um, directed health care providers to do anything that they would not have otherwise done um, I made the argument and continue to to um, advance the position that uh, Laura should have had the opportunity to say I want the property to pass with the instrument I created with my husband of 50 years I, I see value in that. But the re we don't have anything in the record to indicate what um, the testator or the uh, trustor wanted. We have their first will, the first well, trust. Well, I, I understand that. But, oh. but with regard, did, did she regain consciousness? No. Okay. Oh, so oh we no, don't no, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. At the time, at that, that, that day, no. She did live after the date that those uh, items were. And there's nothing in the record to indicate what she thought about those documents. Nothing. So I, it would seem to me your first response to Justice Miles was, "What's the harm? The harm is we don't know whether those documents provide what right. the woman wanted to do." Right. It's an assumption. There's an assumption. Uh, made by the respondent, which you cannot effect. And having probing. done that for a number of years, I can tell you what was done in the last will does not necessarily mean what the person may want in the current will. Right. Isn't that true? Yes. Um, as I um, suggested earlier, the conduct goes to the heart, strikes at the heart of probate. It strikes at the heart of the responsibilities of a Scrivener to actually document what the person wants. That's the role. That there were assumptions made, there were presumptions made, uh, but that's not enough in probate. And then to authenticate these in a manner in which he did uh, strikes at the very heart of what we're all called to do. Unless there are further questions, I think I have um, used up the time that I allotted for the first portion of argument. Any further questions of counsel? Thank you. May it please the court, Chief Justice Nuss, Justices, my name is Amy Limley. And I represent the respondent, Daniel Beck, in this matter. I would request leave of the chief for my client to speak a few minutes at the end of my 15 minutes. That would be granted. The court has asked the question, and the petitioner has answered the question as if we do not know what the mother wanted. And I think that's an unfair characterization based on this record. We do know what she wanted because her son, Robert, told my client what she wanted. <laughs> you mean I have to allow my son to tell my attorney what I want? I'm sorry. That isn't the case. He had, I'm sorry, the, I didn't mean to interrupt you. The client was the woman, the mother, is the client. Would you agree with that? She was one of the clients, yes. Now, you think, you think that uh, a beneficiary is a client? with regard to a will or a trust? 
He was a trustee of the trust. He had her durable power of attorney and was authorized to speak for her on many matters. I agree, Your Honor. He was not authorized to sign her signature. That was what the misconduct in this case. Was but he, he was authorized to de determine the, the uh, objects of her bounty? He was her only heir, and yes, he was. Uh, and, and that was through the power of attorney would allow him to distribute her assets however he deemed appropriate? No, the assets were being distributed according to her trust, but he had talked to her. He knew what she wanted to do, and the changes that were made to the trust were not substantive tr changes. They were asset protection changes. And that, that is one place where I think the, the panel fell down in this fa in the fact finding in this case um, and I think it Explain started to me what you mean by asset pro protection changes so glad you asked that um, the way the trust was originally written and it was a, an older trust the beneficiary which was the son Robert got all the money outright upon the death of his mother the trust was changed so that the money did not go to him individually. It went to his trust, which already existed before his mother's trust was changed. There is actually on my website, www.fulston.com slash downloads slash asset percent 20 protection.pdf, a long article on asset protection and estate planning written by my partner, Tim O'Sullivan. And this is He's written part of the code, the probate code, and knows a lot more about it than I do. But he has indicated, and I think it's not, I think this is just common, I think this is what the law says, that it is an appropriate asset protection feature. It protects the beneficiary from creditors if, the, if instead of the money going directly to an individual, it goes to the trust. There's I understand that, all that. That is that, a benefit. I understand all that, but who gets to make the choice? whether to utilize that asset, asset protection, the son or the owner mother? It should have been the owner mother. She was not questioned directly by my client, but my client was told by her son that she agreed with all this. And there's testimony in the record that she told her son that. Now, the petitioner did not call her son as a witness, uh, but my client testified about what the son had said. And there's no, nothing controverted that. The son said, I've talked to mom. This is what she wants. And because my client had dealt with the son, Robert, for many, many years, he had no reason to, to disbelieve that. Now, you're right, Your Honor. And when, when we made these stipulations, we said he should have communicated with her. We'd actually stipulated to that misconduct. But we did not stipulate to a competency uh, claim. And but but. That was found, and I think that the reason it was found was because people, because the panel was not paying sufficient attention to the value of what was done, and to the testimony that that was in fact what the mother wanted done. So the value of what's done allows for forgery and crimes no. to take place. So I, I, I don't no. understand if it's if it's uh, no harm, no foul kind of attitude here. No, Your Honor. We, that's why we stipulated to some of the of the misconduct. We, we're not saying no harm, no foul. But when you apply these factors, and I think the case law is pretty clear, not just in our trial brief, but in our appellate briefs. And the, and the case that has never been distinguished by petitioner is that matter of grant case. Um, you know, that was the will case where the only punishment was public censure. And the attorney in that case photocopied and superimposed signatures and then submitted that altered will to probate, attesting it was genuine and lawfully executed. And the only since the only sanction, the only punishment that the court imposed was public censure. And it was based on this finding that the conduct was dishonest but not selfish. I've been urging that from the beginning for this, for my client, and there was no evidence to the contrary. But that was ignored by the panel. And I think it's a key fact in determining what's appropriate in this case. Counsel, can I? take you back to the living will. I'm just glancing here at the 2000 provisions versus the 2010 provisions and it looks like there was some pretty basic changes to the 2010 provision only requires one attending physician to determine that there's a terminal illness and, and you know whether there's to be life 
prolonging procedures while the living will from 2000 required two physicians. That's a fairly significant change. I hadn't noticed that change. I don't know why it was in there. Well, I'm just glancing at this. and I'm just saying uh, your argument seems to be uh, focused on the trust, and I'm not sure I'm well, Justice understanding Morris. that argument anyway. But th this is a lot of different changes to a lot of different documents, all of which should have been. Th there isn't any question. And he knew he should have her signature. There's just, I don't know, I guess I don't understand why we're talking about this. We're talking about the difference between someone who is dishonest but not selfish and someone who is dishonest and selfish or engages in fraud. There was no crime here. There was no forgery. That requires both specific intent and an overt act. It was fraud. It's fraud upon the court. It's fraud. It's fraud. It's a fraudulent it, signature. It isn't just fraud in her signature. It's fraud in having his wife sign that she had seen the signature. Uh, it's fraud in signing the notary's signature. It's fraud in signing his own signature. And you have the CLE of practicing law with, for three years without a license. This isn't just, you know, a small small thing here. I, I didn't intend to imply it was small. I what I am arguing to the court in, is that there was no selfishness, no personal gain involved in any of this conduct. I thought he billed the client for his services. He did bill the client for the services and he was paid. But again, as our brief points out, if that were the basis for finding personal gain, then there would be virtually no disciplinary case in which that aggravating factor wouldn't be found because virtually all of these disciplinary cases arise in the context of an attorney-client privilege in which, the, in which the attorney either is paid or expects to get paid for the work product that he does. Ms. So Lindley. that's not a dis really a distinction. Excuse me. Um, what about the personal gain in the goodwill of the client? It sounds like one of your arguments is he didn't get any money out of it other than a fee that to which he was entitled for performing certain services. And we can't turn every case into a the fee becomes the personal gain. But it sounded like the argument was he was just trying to stay in the good graces of this long-term client and be accommodating to help that client. Of course, the problem is that client isn't the client really in this matter. The, the mother was a client. So can that be the personal gain that makes an act selfish on the part of a lawyer? I don't remember reading any cases that made that kind of connection between accommodating or pleasing a client and gain for the attorney. I suppose that on a concept, in a conceptual sense that could be true. Um, from what Dr. Quillen testified, this was a personality characteristic of my client and not a um, it, no overt criminal intent was involved or no overt intent to defraud or harm anyone was involved. It was a, it was an attempt to please the client. So I suppose it, that that is a personal gain to him, but it's also a gain to the, to who he perceived at the time to be his client. And, and as Justice Johnson said, the client he should have been thinking about was the mother and not his other client, the son, and he didn't. And that was that was negligence. It was also misconduct. Uh, and he got off on the misconduct path by taking the first negligence fork in the road where he considered Robert to be his son and not the mother. But there was nothing, no ill will, no personal gain, no, no selfish motive in any of this. So if there's no crime, and, and I appreciate that there's is fraud, and I used that word in the original trial brief, and I used the word forgery as well, but if you look at the elements of those things, he did, he did not commit a crime because those, the crimes, the, the statutes under Chapter 21, Crimes and Punishments, requires an intent to obtain a personal benefit that's, as, as near as I can tell from reading it, financial or some other benefit other than making someone happy, making a client happy. I understand your arguments on that front, but why wasn't three years of unauthorized practice of law f uh, selfish motivation? I talked about the Holmberg case with the panel, and in that case, this court made a distinction between administrative suspensions and suspensions under discipline. And I think when you fit that in here and you look at the conduct, 
my client testified he didn't have a real appreciation for the administrative suspension meaning i cannot practice law and i think the excuse for that is well put in the record which is the 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 very serious episode of depression he was under at the time and we have a lot in the record about that um and and of course there wasn't really any challenge to that i'm not i'm not saying justice that that was appropriate but it was explained by something we often see in our profession which is profound depression and he worked his way out of it and as as far as we can tell and he, and he has testified no other client other than this situation ever had these problems come up he, he did not ever cheat on the notary signatures in any other time he did not ever tell any other client you can sign your mother's name and by the way after this when he did some typographical corrections he sent them back to robert and said get your mother to sign these that was in the transmittal letter after this conduct took place doesn't excuse what he did the first time but i think it's good proof that he did not have any intent to harm this woman in the six months or so that she lived did he ever seek to to have her sign to, to do basically do a do-over on all these he himself personally did not but he asked robert to when he sent the documents to him and said have your mother sign these and i and i don't think the as i read as i read the cover letter i don't think he said every single document to robert said have her resign every one of these it was the have trust notarized and yes it was the trust. he didn't give her instructions on all the documents and and suggest that he have her sign them while she was awake and he didn't suggest that oh by the way i'll need to go explain all these documents to her he did not I and mean, there was never any attempt for him to explain the change that he had the son essentially make for her on any of these documents um, he he sent the corrected trust back and said have your mother sign this and, and he didn't self-report this was learned through another attorney when he when the when the son attempts to to uh, that is correct essentially apparently the son is then surprised by what's been done and doesn't realize that he now has a trust and his his uh, property is now going into this trust as opposed to going straight to him well that's what mr brookins said that's not what right. my client said right there was a disagreement on the testimony on that but that's how it all came to light was another attorney who the son yes. speaks to Mr. Brookins, who's a legislature and attorney, was the one who called it to the attention of the disciplinary administrator and sought an immunity agreement for Robert. Mm -hmm. okay. Counsel, can you refresh my recollection on why the urgency for this action? The urgency was, was self-imposed, um, Justice Nuss. The weather was terrible. They, they were going up there to get her to sign it. My client was concerned that these end of life documents needed to be refreshed because by this time they were getting quite stale. When they went up there in this bad weather, there wasn't a notary up there. Actually, my client had intended for his secretary to come with them, but because of both illness and the weather, she wasn't able to come. So I think looking at this in hindsight and trying to look at it objectively, I think he was feeling intense pressure to get it done because they had made this large effort big effort to get up there but that was a self-imposed uh, urgency it was not a legal urgency it was something he imposed on himself under the circumstances at the time does that answer your question i was looking at some notes i had taken and what was the urgency not only in getting up there but having false signatures perform if the woman is there was there any effort to try to see if they could obtain her consent or her signatures on anything? That's what I'm missing. My client did not go into the room with Robert, as I understand it. Robert went in the room, and they came back out and said, I can't wake Mom. And that's when... I'm sorry, what was that last part? I cannot wake Mom. Cannot wake Mom. And, and that that is when they decided to go ahead and sign the documents without talking to her, which was obviously misconduct. But that's my understanding of how that came about. And then she lived how much longer after that? About six months. Okay. Right, thank you. 
I'm about out, I am out of time and my client would like to speak to the court for a few minutes with the court's permission. That would be appropriate. Thank you. Chief Justice Ness and uh, Justices, <clears throat> I want to thank you for this opportunity to stand before you and speak directly to you. I want to say just a few things on my own behalf about this matter. First, I want to assure the court that I know what I did was wrong, and I've learned from my mistakes. With regard to the CLE, I know that those hours must be properly reported pursuant to the rules. I allowed personal problems to take priority over taking care of this important task. If there's a problem in the future with the record of hours taken, I must deal with that problem immediately. And certainly, if there's notification from the Bar Association, the CLE Commission, or this court that my license to practice law is in question, I stop all other activity and do all that is necessary. Well, counsel, I want to interrupt you there because the, the notice didn't say, you know, that your license, that there's some question or that there's a problem. The notice that you received, the order said, Beck is hereby suspended from the practice of law in this state. And that was for three years. Yes. There wasn't any question about that. No. And this isn't just a technicality. Your license was suspended and you continued to practice. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, and with, without exception, there aren't any shortcuts when it comes to the proper procedure required to execute important documents. I sacrificed proper procedures for the sake of expediency, and I have not committed such a lapse in judgment before or since, nor have I ever before or since uh, directed a client to, client to sign without proper authority. I've learned from these mistakes through the process of being disciplined for them. I am a more conscientious attorney as a result of having learned these lessons. I've actually been seeing uh, uh, Dr. Gary Hackney every two weeks for talk therapy, who's been a source of further insight into why I did what I did and the necessary changes of thinking uh, to prevent their reoccurrence. My CLE is up to date. Uh, for 2013 and 14, and I actually have carryover hours for the 2014-15 period. The amended plan of probation that we have been uh, we have put in place includes effective protocols to prevent the reoccurrence of any of these acts. I also want to ensure and assure the court that I'm sorry for the mistakes that I've made. I'm sorry that due to my mistakes and lapse in judgment. The good planning documents I generated for my client were not effective. I apologize for all this time and energy having been spent as a result of those mistakes. I blame no one but myself. I take full responsibility for them. I suffer remorse, embarrassment, and self-reproach for what I have done and the impact it has had on those around me, our profession, and my clients. I'm deeply humbled by this disciplinary process. <clears throat> Finally, I want to assure the court that I will not repeat these mistakes. Uh, I know, as I said, that what I did was wrong. Uh, through this disciplinary process, the lessons I have learned have changed me. I've suffered the embarrassment of this ordeal. A day hasn't gone by that I haven't thought through my mistakes and sought not to commit them again. I can assure you that I will not commit them again. <clears throat> The discussions I have had with Steve Angermeyer and Tammy Martin and Amy Limley and Jack Foch and Drs. Hackney and Quillen, as well as other attorneys and professionals whom I great, re greatly respect, have reassured me that I have a great many friendly resources. I've asked my supervising attorneys specifically to help ensure that these mistakes will not be repeated. The amended plan of pro probation that we have proposed is not merely window dressing. These or similar measures will be in place for the remainder of my career. I benefit from Tammy Martin's oversight. Her presence is constant. 
She offices now 30 feet from me. Only the conference room separates her, our offices. I check in with her daily about my client schedule and upcoming signing ceremonies are posted on a group calendar. She checks up on me constantly too. She and my assistant Kim have a close working relationship and Steve Angermeyer continues to be an unofficial resource. And finally, for nearly two years now, each and every signing ceremony that we've conducted has either been carefully reported to my former supervisor, uh, Steve Angermeyer, and since this August has been physically attended by Tammy Martin, my current supervising attorney. Thank you, Your Honors. Do we have any questions? I, I do. You mentioned that your assistant, Kim. Is that the same Kim uh, whose signature you uh, f uh, placed on the notary? Yes, Your Honor. And so was she aware that you had signed her name to that? Uh, no, Your Honor. So, but were to expect her to be uh, supervising you and keeping you in uh, uh, from committing this problem again when she didn't notice it the first time? You understand what I'm saying? I, I if don't she, think I do. If she didn't catch it that you'd forged her name to the uh, will, how, how is she keeping you in line? Well, I don't think she reviewed. She certainly didn't know that I did that on the day that I did it. And I, I don't think she, I know she doesn't double check all the documents, any of them that come back in. The other question I had is you said something to the effect about you were sorry that these documents were not effective. Were they set aside? I don't know that, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. You'd reserve four minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, just very briefly, in response to your question, I would suggest the record does not demonstrate any urgency. There was no urgency to this situation, which is one of the reasons it's somewhat inexplicable. Um, there, she wouldn't wake up. There is no reason that these could not, these documents could not have been presented to her at a later time. Uh, it makes, it makes the, uh, the conduct all the more inexplicable. Uh, I would point out that Dr. Quillen did not testify that any disorder contributed to the conduct in the Hettenbach case. He said he would not, he, he, the uh, diagnosis did not contribute to the dishonest conduct of the respondent in the Hettenbach case. Um, I would also point out that all of these, uh, the, well, not all of these, but this instance with regard to the signing didn't occur in the office on a, uh, on a weekday. These were at a, the nursing home. Um, the, and I point that out as it appears, uh, it, it's a very, very difficult thing to supervise. The respondent and his wife go to the nursing home. Uh, the, the notary stamp was in his briefcase. Um, I am renewing a, a suggestion to this court that the conduct demonstrates conduct that cannot be well supervised um, and would recommend and compel the court to conclude that probation is not appropriate. In your mind, differentiate for me, because I understand, um, I understood you to say disbarment was. Mm -hmm. There and then in the hearing report, it said your sort of bottom line was indefinite suspension, no less than. Right. In your mind, I mean, I can understand why you'd be in the suspension mm -hmm. column. I'm not sure I understand why you drip over into the disbarment column. The respondent engaged in intentional conduct, knowing, knowing that his conduct. Um, was fraudulent. He directed a client to sign the 
name of another person another client and i'll call i'll call laura a client although they'd never met and i would suggest that his conduct could rise to the level of criminal conduct he also placed his client robert had in bach in in my assessment of his car what he directed him to do at risk of criminal sanction and mr brooke and the complainant in this case recognize that when he he described the dilemma that he had between disclosing the information or the report to the disciplinary administrators office but at the same time exposing his client then to risk of criminal sanction so he got his client signature i mean a consent to go to the county attorney and he went to the county attorney first to get immunity described the situation obtained immunity from immunity from the county attorney and then provided to off at our office the information related to the uh the professional misconduct there was a very real risk of at least subjecting robert to questions uh concerning his conduct and for those reasons his intentional conduct created a very serious potential injury or injury to either robert or laura that adversely affects on his and seriously uh affects his uh, ability to continue practicing law any further questions i see none thank you thank you, thank you all for your arguments this morning court will take this matter under advisement